Okay, so our uh, last speaker for this uh, um, afternoon session is Evin Snyder from uh, the University of Rade Kralove. He will speak about differential invariance of Kuhn space times. Please. Thanks, Andrea. And thanks to the organizers for letting me speak here. Uh, so, the topic I will talk about is Kuhn space times. Uh, contrary to the last uh, lecture, space times for me do not satisfy the Einstein equation necessarily. So it's just Lorentzian space times. And well, we will try to solve the equivalence problems of these things. So let me start. Yeah. So, and, and yeah, this is based on a joint, joint paper with Boris Kruglikov. So let me start with defining Kuhn space times. So formally, they are, um, well, a Lorentzian metric G on an n dimensional manifold is a Kuhn metric if there exists a vector. Well, Field L satisfying these equations here. So this is quite complicated. Don't worry too much about it. We will very soon write it down in coordinates. Things will be easy. So if in addition, uh, the Riemann tensor is aligned and of algebraically special type two, and the covariant derivative of the Riemann tensor is aligned and of algebraically special type two, then we will call it a degenerate Kuhn metric. So uh, for any Kuhn metric, there exists local coordinates u, x1 to xn minus 2, uh, and v, in which g takes this nice form here. So h, wi, and hij are functions. See that they depend on, on everything except for this hij that don't depend on v. So all, all Kuhn metrics are locally of this form. Uh, and in these coordinates, uh, this uh, vector field L can be written as partial V, and uh, and G is a degenerate Kuhn metric if and only if W i v v is equal to zero for every i from one to n minus two, and H v v is equal to zero. So now we have a nice description of these things. Uh, so the equivalence problem is basically the following. Uh, so if you have two metrics or or if you have one metric, make a coordinate transformation. Uh, if, if what you started with was a Kunt metric, then you also end up with a Kunt metric. And these are in some sense said to be equivalent. So, um, so we say that two metrics are equivalent if there exists a diffeomorphism bringing one to the other. Uh, and then the important task is to recognize equivalent Kunt metrics and distinguish inequivalent ones. So one of the common approaches uh, in this like in general relativity and this field is to use uh, polynomial curvature invariance, uh, meaning total contractions of curvature ten of the curvature tensor and its covariant derivatives. But not all space times can be separated by such invariance. And in particular, in dimension four, the degenerate Kuhn space times, which I defined on the previous slides, are exactly those that cannot be separated by polynomial curvature invariants. So this was kind of our motivation. There are some special metrics that cannot be separated by standard methods. And well, we know some other methods, so let's try to see what we can find. Uh, but since, in, in, as I showed in the coordinates, these two types of Kunt metrics are very similar, so we can, we can uh, consider them both more or less simultaneously. So to simplify the problem, we will just st stick with these coordinates um, and assume that the metric is of this form you see here. Uh, but then, of course, we cannot use arbitrary coordinate transformations anymore. We need to choose only such transformations that preserve this form. Uh, and it's not so difficult to find. You can just uh, write down and like completely arbitrary transformations in transformation in coordinates apply to this metric and try to solve the equations in order to get, get the metric of the same form. And you get this quite nice uh, pseudo group of transformations. So uh, a, um, a i and b are functions of u and xs, and c is a function of u. And we have these conditions to make it uh, invertible. And the corresponding Lie algebra uh, 
consists of vector fields of this form. And we will mostly just talk about the D algebra, but it's, yeah, you can think about either. Um, so we think about this, um, these uh, metrics as sections of a bundle. Uh, and we can, uh, we can write the bundle like this. So we have phi from m times f to m, and f here is a subspace of Rn, n is n choose two, which is the number of, uh, of functional parameters of our Kunt space types. Um, and the domain in Rn is de defined by the requirement that the matrix Hij is positive definite, so that we actually get some metrics here. Learns in metrics. Uh, and then uh, the transformation. So, so we have these transformations on the base on M that preserves these metrics, but they can be lifted to the total space by requiring the lifts to preserve the horizontal symmetric form capital G. So it's exactly the same uh, kind of thing that we saw before, but now instead um, of considering these as functions, we consider them as coordinates on the fibers of the bundle. So then lift x hat of a vector field x or the, from the previous slide is found by setting, well, taking some arbitrary, um, or let's say, yeah, um, some combination of, um, of, uh, vector of vectors in the fiber directions and then determining the coefficients by solving this equation. The result is the following. We have this nice formula for, for the, the action on, on the total space of the bundle. Um, and the notation here is quite straightforward. Uh, only thing I should explain is that A uh, L I is the deriv partial derivative of A L with respect to X I. So these depend on derivatives of, of the parameters here. Okay, so uh, let JK pi denote the space of K jets of sections of pi or the space of Taylor polynomials of, uh, of degree K of the functional parameters of our metric. So the choice of coordinates on the total space f times m gives a natural set of coordinates on j, k, pi. For example, on j1 of pi, we get the following coordinates. So we have the same coordinates as before, but we also add some co coordinates corresponding to the first derivatives of, um, of these uh, functions. So if g is a section of pi given by by these functions here, so I, I write with the tilde to separate them from the coordinates. Then it prolongs naturally to a section j1, g of the bundle j1 pi. And it's given as the notation suggests this way. So h i j u is just the partial derivative of this function at u. No, uh, that is this function with respect to u and so on. And well, I think it's clear how this uh, generalizes to j k pi, and yeah, so you can, and any section gives rise to a section on j k pi in the same way as I showed here. Uh, but we are of course not working with arbitrary sections. We had some differential equations that these must satisfy, uh, and in particular for Kuhn space times we had this equation, uh, h i j d equal to zero. Consider this as a subset in J1 pi, denoted by E1. And of course, if a solution, if you have a smooth solution to this equation, it is also a smooth solution to derivatives of this equation. So if we differentiate all of this, um, we get a new equation. You can consider this as an equation in J2 pi and so on. So we, we get a submanifold EK in JK pi for every K. Uh, for the degenerate Kuhn space times, we have a sub PDE E tilde K side of EK 
it's defined this way. So on J1, they are the same. You have an additional second order equation, WIV so equal to zero, that we add to the equations for E2. And on E3, we have, well, we still have this second order equation. We have its derivative and we have this last condition. And when you go to higher order, you can just differentiate this and obtain the new uh, the equations till the EK. Uh, and the re reason for this, uh, or like the, the, the reason this is a good idea is that if G is a section of pi, then the section uh, GK of G is contained in this submanifold EK if and only if it's a Kunt metric of the form one. And similarly uh, for degenerate Kunt metrics and tilde EK. So, uh, and also any vector field X in G prolongs to a vector field X at K on JK in the standard way. So if you have, uh, if you have a vector field on the total base, in the total space, then it lifts uh, uniquely to a vector field on JK pi. So this is because you, if you have a transformation on, on the total space, then it also transforms sections here and also derivatives of sections. And in this way, it acts on the, on the jets. So we would like to distinguish sections of pi satisfying E or tilde under the equivalence relation given by the algebra tree. So both of these are of infinite dimension. So the space of sections is infinitely big and the Lie algebra too. So what we will do is to consider these finite dimensional submanifolds of JK uh, that are of finite dimension and have G orbits of finite dimension. So we have a kind of simpler problem to consider and it will in the end uh, actually give us a complete solution. So, uh, yeah, so we want to, to describe orbits on EK. We do it in terms of invariant functions. So functions that are constant on the orbits. And differential invariant over K is a function on EK, or if you consider degenerate Kuhn space times, it's a function on tilde EK, which is constant on G orbits. Um, so, uh, this is one of the, the main theorems. It's actually like a consequence of the general Litresa theorem, which was in its most recent form is uh, as a contribution by uh, Boris Krugelfall and Valentin Lushagin. And for our particular case, it says that the algebra rational differential invariance separates orbits in general position for both Kunt space times and degenerate Kunt space times. And th this algebra is the is generated by a finite number of differential invariants and invariant derivations. Um, so in order to find generators, our one of the strategies are, are the following. So uh, by definition, a differential invariant is a function on our equation. By restricting it to a section G of pi, we obtain a function of M on M. So we take a uh, section G, compute its prolongation JK. It is now a map from M to, um, to EK. And it can be then be composed with a function from, uh, yeah, from EK to R. So we get the map from M to R, our function on M. Uh, and if we have N, invariants that are independent when restricted to G. So if we have, if we have this relation, uh, then we can, use, uh, we can use them as coordinates on them. And we can write G in terms of these coordinates. Uh, and then we get some new uh, coefficients here, Kij, that are functions of Ig1 to Ign. And when, you had, when we have done this for, let's say, two Kunt uh, metrics, 
then we can just compare them directly because uh, they are equivalent if and only if the functions k i j are equal. Uh, and uh, also, actually, we can use we can use this to generate all invariants, basically by because these k i j they are also differential invariants, and we when we differentiate them with respect to the i's, we get invariants of higher order, and it turns out that we can well actually because of this we can generate all of them. Uh, so uh, let's see what we can do for general Kuhn metrics. They can be distinguished by polynomial curvature invariants, and in particular, we may take these invariants. So here, rich, this is the Ricci operator. So you can get it by raising an index of the Ricci tensor, and just compose it with itself multiple times and take traces, and you get um, you get uh, several differential invariants, scalar invariants. Uh, and they are, the first n of these are independent this way. So uh, here are what, um, this is the horizontal differential. It basically means that after restriction to a metric and then after taking the uh, exterior differential, like before you, you get something non-zero. So, uh, yeah, so the horizontal differential is basically defined such that uh, such that after restriction, it's exactly the exterior differential. Or in, in coordinates, you can write it like this, where instead of partial derivatives, you usually have, you have total derivatives. Uh, the difference is that if you take the partial derivative of u, for example, applied to h, you will get zero because h is a coordinate on the fiber. But if you take the, the total derivative applied to h, you will get h u, which is a different, different coordinate on j1. Uh, so on this Sarisky open set where this equation holds, or non-equation holds, then these um, one forms form an invariant horizontal co-frame. And we can also construct the horizontal, uh, the dual, dual frame of invariant derivations. So it's a linear combination of total derivatives satisfying, uh, yeah, this just is normal equation for, for duals, dual vectors. And so now we can express the horizontal symmetric form uh, in terms of this horizontal co-frame and Kij uh, will then be just rational differential invariants of order three. So basically it's, it's exactly the same as I did on the previous slide, but I just didn't say anything about, about the section. So I did everything without specifying the section. Now, if you want to, you can put in the section and you get back exactly what we had before. Uh, and the theorem is that uh, the algebra of rational differential invariants is generated by, for example, this n differential invariants i and um, and plus one choose two invariants k i j and the invariant derivations uh, partial i. So let's see what we get for degenerate Kuhn metrics. So the like from before we we knew that this should not work for degenerate Kuhn metrics, and this was the motivation. So uh, in this case, um, we have. Is equal uh, this this identity here. So these uh, um, invariants we found from the Ricci tensor, they are not independent anymore. In general, only n minus one of them are horizontal independent. So yeah, in particular, uh, all, none of them depends on v in our coordinates. Uh, but what we can do is to take n minus one independent invariants among these. And, uh, and we can compute their uh, horizontal differentials and compute their G duals. So we use this horizontal symmetric two form G to, uh, to raise indices and yeah, compute, uh, compute uh, invariance derivations. So, 
the invariants can be chosen, invariants j1 to j n minus one can be chosen such that nabla two to nabla n minus one are space like vector fields. Um, oh, and yeah, making this matrix here for i from two to n minus one positive definite. And then we can define the nth derivation because we're only missing one in order to get a frame here. So we can define the nth derivation by these equations. Uh, so g nabla one nabla n is equal to one and g nabla i nabla n for every other i is equal to zero. And this determines the last derivation uniquely and they will be, be independent partly yeah, because of this and uh, yeah. So again, you can you can construct a dual co-frame. Uh, you can write the you can write g in terms of them. You get a new set of invariants, uh, and here yeah they are defined like this, and they are they are differential invariants of order three. So in this case, uh, we also have non-trivial commutation relations. In the previous case, the, all commutation relations vanished, but now we we have something non-trivial non here. So uh, nabla i nabla j commutator of this is equal to some linear combination of nabla k, where the coefficients here are differential invariants of order three. Uh, and the result is that. The algebra of differential invariants is generated by differential invariants Lij, Cijk, and the invariant derivations of nabla i. Okay, so um, this was uh, one approach, and it's but in some sense it's very flexible regarding the choice of n invariants and or, or invariant derivations. So all we require is that yeah, either that uh, that this expression here is non-vanishing, or that uh, if we work with invariant derivations, that they are independent on generic points. Uh, so, um, yeah, in, in one particular uh, choice of invariant is is uh, this one, because it turns out that in, in our coordinates there is exactly one differential invariant of order one, and it's quite nice. So. Could have used this instead of one of the invariants from before. Uh, and yeah, actually, it's not as simple as it looks because this Hij is the inverse matrix of this Hij, which contains the coordinates. So it's a bit more complicated. Uh, in particular, we have the determinant of this matrix here in the denominator. Of this. Ah, I should have. Yeah, this is I1. So uh, let's, uh, yeah, uh, I want to show you another choice of generators by n equal to three and actually show you some functions, uh, some rational functions. So to simplify our notation, we will just neglect the indices from H, W, and, R, and H because it's just one choice for each of them. Uh, and let us start by, con by finding a horizontal frame. So the derivations here are invariant and they are independent in the Sariska open subset of E2. So they're quite, quite simple, uh, much simpler than the derivations you would have gotten it by writing out the derivations from the previous approach. Uh, and yeah, in particular, you see that they have some kind of diagonal form. This is only in the v direction, this is only in the x and v direction, and this is in x, u, and v direction. Um, and they satisfy this equation. You can think about this as the definition of um, invariant derivation if you want. And uh, in fact, this is the equation we solve in order to find this, uh, this simpler invariants. Mm, but, but one reason we're able to do this is that the dimension is so low. So if you go to dimension four, it's already on the limit. Dimension five, I'm not sure if you 
yeah, they, they would be quite quite huge. Um, so if we again construct a horizontal dual coframe, frame, uh, then we can write G in terms of this. So in terms of the invariant, the derivations from our previous slide, we get this very nice formula for the metric. So we have the invariant I1 here that I had on the previous slide, and we have two new invariants as well. So I1 in three dimensions is just this very simple thing. We have two other differential invariants of order two. Uh, and yeah, actually, yeah, you know, for n equal to three, the algebra of differential invariants is generated by these three differential invariants and the invariant derivations on the previous slide. So let's, uh, yeah, um, and uh, here we had so far three invariants. But you can actually complete. Um, complete the set of second order invariants because there are only two more independent ones. We have this one here and this is a bit more complicated. And these two together with I1, J1 and J2 constitute a transcendent spaces for the field of second order differential invariants in E2. So let's see what we get with degenerate Kuhn space times. And you, you can notice one thing already here because we know that uh, at least on order two, we have one additional PDE. Uh, it was, uh, or yeah, it, W DV equal to zero. So the dimension reduces by one and actually the orbit dimensions are the same. That means that we should have one less independent invariant of order two than we restrict. So we'll see that it happens. Uh, so we still have this invariant I1, uh, and we also have this invariant here. HVV is suddenly a very simple, nice invariant. Uh, I2B, this thing is also invariant. We will also use, define these functions. They are not invariant, but they will be useful for writing down the next invariant. Uh, but first, we also define Q and R. They are defined in terms of I2A, K2, yeah, I2A and I2B, K2A, K2B. So if you write them out, they are quite complicated. Uh, and then we can write our, uh, our last second order invariant, which is, well, it contains Q here, and it contains all, all the expressions, I2A, I2B, K2A, K2B. So, Again, if you try to write it out, it's, it's quite big. Uh, and in this case, we actually have uh, this inequality here. So, so I1, I2A, and I2C are independent on the series open set. So this means that it is possible to express G in terms of them as before. And in this way, we can find a generating set of invariants. Alternatively, we can use these invariant derivations. So they are again given in terms of the functions on the previous slide. So here we have Q, here we have K to A, here we even have R. So they are not as simple as they look, but still they are they're not that bad. Uh, and we have the following statement that the algebra of differential invariants is generated by the differential invariants I1, I2A, and I2C, and invariant derivations NABLA1, NABLA2, and NABLA3. Yes, and that was actually what I wanted to tell you. Here are some of the uh, references I referred to in the talk. And it was, uh, yeah, more references can be found in this paper. Uh, which the talk was based on. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Are there any questions? I had a question. Um, maybe that goes back to the Lee Tress theorem. So, in that theorem, um, 
it says that these rational differential invariants separate orbits in general position, I think is what you said. Yep. Can you elaborate on what that means? Yeah, so it means that for each order, you, you can consider the orbits on, uh, on this equation EK. Um, and general position means that, um, means that, uh, there exists a Sariski closed set on EK that you can re remove such that on all other points, um, the invariant separate orbits. So this, the invariant separate orbits outside the Sariski closed uh, set on each, uh, each of these spaces EK. Okay, and so then when you restrict to the degenerate Kunt metrics or to some other special subset, then you're basically restricting to that subset and applying this theorem on there, like to the generic points within that more special yeah, set of yeah. metrics. Is that yeah, okay? That's, that's and um, and so then, but so that I guess um, you know for like Riemannian metrics, we know that those scalar curvature invariants separate all all orbits, right? That they're a complete set of invariants. Um, and so is, is it known of, say for these quint metrics, even if you consider the differential um, invariants, whether it's possible to really separate all of the orbits um, or is it somehow known that that's not possible, that it would only be possible on some it's a risky open set. Uh, so, uh, so are you asking? If there, uh. I guess because you know, like in for in the Riemannian case, we know that scalar curvature invariants really do separate, and we know that in higher signature like Lorentzian and pseudo Riemannian, they don't, right? Yes. And so, with the differential invariants, I mean, um, is it known sort of what are the, the capabilities or what are the limitations of those invariants? Well, so in, in general, these invariants are rational functions. So, ah, okay. uh, and there will always, or there can always be some subset where they are either not defined or not yeah. independent. Uh, yeah, so, so maybe there are some, some subsets that they, they do not separate still, but then you can do the same thing on this subset again. Um, you can restrict to, to the singular subsets and consider just action here. And then your, the orbits that were before singular are now gen generic and, and you can do everything all over again. Okay, thank you. Other questions? And what about, uh, for example, uh, four-dimensional Ricci flat case? If in if, if in Ricci flat case you can distinguish all of these uh, metrics by your invariant? Uh, we cannot use exact. Of course, the, the invariants I gave here you cannot use. So you need to use some different invariants. So if you go back here, yeah, here so we use here we use the Ricci tensor to find them. So yeah, we cannot, we cannot, at, at least we cannot use these invariants anymore. Uh, and we, we, well, we actually didn't really consider this problem, but impossible, yeah, imp you can use the, the same kind of techniques. You just need to find another set of uh, N independent invariants. So you're all the time of the Einstein case, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, other question for David? If not, uh, let's thank him again. Thanks, everyone.